The Nameless City When I drew nigh the Nameless City, I knew it was accursed. I was traveling in a parched and terrible valley under the moon, and afar I saw it protruding uncannily above the sands as part of a corpse may protrude from an ill-made grave. Fear spoke from the age-worn stones of this hoary survivor of the deluge, this great-grandmother of the eldest pyramid, and a viewless aura repelled me and bade me retreat from antique and sinister secrets that no man should see, and no man else had ever dared to see. Remote in the desert of Arabi lies the nameless city, crumbling and inarticulate, its low walls nearly hidden by the sand of unaccounted ages. It must have been thus before the first stones of Memphis were laid, and while the bricks of Babylon were yet unbaked. There is no legend so old as to give it a name, or to recall that it was ever alive. But it is told of in whispers around campfires and muttered about by grandmas and tents of Sheik, so that all the tribes shun it without wholly knowing why. It was of this place that Abdul al-Hazra, the mad poet, dreamed on the night before he sang his unexplained couplet, that it is not dead which can eternal lie, and with strange eons even death may die. I should have known that the Arabs had a good reason for shunning the nameless city, the city told of in strange tales but seen by no living man, yet I defied them and went to the untrodden waste with my camel. I alone have seen it. That is why no other face bears such hideous lines of fear as mine. Why no other man shivers so horribly when the night wind rattles the windows. When I came upon it, in the ghastly stillness of unending sleep, it looked at me, chilly from the rays of a cold moon amidst the desert's heat, and as I returned its look, I forgot my triumph at finding it, and stopped still with my camel to wait for dawn. For hours I waited, till the east grew gray and the stars faded, and the gray turned to rose seal light edged with gold. I heard a moaning and saw a storm of sand stirring among the antique stones, though the sky was clear, and the vast reaches of the desert still. Then, suddenly, above the desert's far rim came the blazing edge of the sun, seen through the tiny sandstorm which was passing away. In my fevered state I fancied that from some remote depth there came a crash of musical metal to hail the fiery discs of Memnon, hailed from the banks of the Nile. My ears rang and my imagination seethed as I led my camel slowly across the sand to the unvocal stone place, that place too old for Egypt and Maromi to remember, that place which I alone of living men have seen. In and out amongst the shapeless foundation of houses and palaces I wandered, finding never a carving or inscription to tell those men, if men they were, who built the city and dwelt therein so long ago. The antique of the spot was unwholesome, and I longed to encounter some sign of device to prove that the city was indeed fashioned by mankind. There were certain proportions and dimensions in the city which I did not like. I had with me many tools, and dug much within the walls of many obliterated edifices, but progress was slow, and nothing significant was revealed. When night and the moon returned, I felt a chill wind which brought new fear, so that I did not dare to remain in the city. As I went outside the antique walls to sleep, a small sighing sandstorm gathered behind me, blowing over the gray stones, though the moon was bright and most of the desert still. I wakened just at dawn from a pageant of horrible dreams, my ears ringing as from some metallic peal. I saw the sun peering readily through the last gusts of little sandstorms that hovered over the nameless city, and marked the quietness of the rest of this landscape. Once more, I ventured within those brooding ruins that swelled beneath the sand like an ogre under a coverlet, and again, dug vainly for relics of a forgotten race. At noon I rested, and the afternoon I spent much of my time tracing the walls and the bygones of the street, and the outline of the nearly vanished buildings, I saw that the city had been mighty indeed, and wondered at the source of its greatness. 
To myself I pictured all the splendor of the ages so distant that Chaldea could not recall it, and thought of Sunarth, the doomed, that stood in the land of Menar when mankind was young, and of Ibi, that was carven of gray stone before mankind existed. All at once I came upon a place where the bedrock rose stark to the sand and formed a low cliff, and here I saw with joy what seemed to promise further traces of the Andovian people. Hewn rudely on the face of the cliff were the unmistakable facades of several small, squat rock houses or temples, whose interiors might preserve many secrets of the ages too remote for calculation, though the sandstorm had long since effaced any carvings which might have been outside. Very low and sand-choking were all the dark apertures near me, but I cleared one with a spade and crawled through it, carrying a torch to reveal whatever mysteries it might hold. When I was inside, I saw the cavern was indeed a temple, and beheld plain signs of the race that had lived and worshipped before the desert was a desert. Primitive altars, pillars, and niches, all curiously low, were not absent, and though I saw no sculptures nor frescoes, there were many singular stone clearly shaped into symbol of artificial meaning. The lowness of the chiseled chamber was very strange, for I could hardly more than kneel upright. But the area was so great that my torch shoot only part at a time. I shuddered oddly in some of the far corners, for certain altars and stones suggest forgotten rites of terrible, revolting, and inexplicable nature, and made me wonder what manner of men could have made a frequent such a temple. When I had seen all the places it contained, I crawled out again, a vid to find another temple might yield. Night had now approached, yet the tangible things I had seen made curiosity stronger than fear, so that I did not flee from the long moon cast shadows and daunted me when I first saw the nameless city. In the twilight I cleared another aperture and with a new torch crawled into it, finding more vague stones and symbols, though nothing more definite than the other temple had contained. The room was just as low, but much less broad, ending in a very narrow passage, crowded with obscure and cryptic shrines. About these shrines I was prying when the noise of wind and my camel outside broke through the stillness and drew me forth to see what could have frightened the beast. The moon was gleaming vividly over the primeval ruins, lighting a dense cloud of sand that seemed blown by a strong but decreasing wind from some point along the cliff ahead of me. I knew it was this chilly, sandy wind that had disturbed the camel and was about to lead him to a place of better shelter, but I chanced to glance up and saw there was no wind atop the cliff. This astonished me and made me fearful again, but I immediately recalled the sudden local winds I had seen and heard before at sunrise and sunset, and judged it as a normal thing. I decided that it came from some rock fissure leading to the cave, and I watched the troubled sand to trace its source, soon perceiving that it came from the black orifice of the temple a long distance south of me, almost out of sight. Against the choking sand cloud I plodded towards the temple, which, as I neared it, loomed larger than the rest. As I shooned a doorway far less clogged with caked sand, I would have entered had it not terrific force of icy winds almost quenched my torch. It poured madly out of the dark door, sighing uncannily as it ruffled the sand and spread out in the weird ruins. Soon it grew fainter, and the sand grew more still, till finally all was at rest. But a presence seemed stalking, almost a spectral stone of the city, and when I glanced at the moon it seemed to quiver as through mirrored and unquiet waters. I was more afraid than I could explain, but not enough to dull my thirst for wonder. So as soon as the wind was quite gone, I crossed into the dark chamber from which it had come. The temple, as I had fancied from the outside, was larger than either of those I had visited before, and was presumably a natural cavern, since it bore winds from some region beyond. Here I could stand a quite upright, but saw that the stones and altars were as low as those in the other temples. On the walls and roofs I beheld for the first time some traces of pictorial art of the ancient race, curious curling streaks of paint that had almost faded or crumbled away, and on two of the altars I saw with rising excitement a maze of well-fashioned curvilinear lines. As I held my torch aloft, it seemed to me that the shape of the roof was too regular to be natural, and wondered what prehistoric cutters of stone had first worked upon. Their engineering skills must have been vast. Then a brighter flare of fantastic flame shooed me from which I had been seeking. The opening to remote abyss whence the sudden wind had blown, 
and I grew faint when I saw that it was a small and plainly artificial door chiseled in the solid rock. I thrust my torch within, beholding a black tunnel, with a roof arching low over a rough flight of very small, numerous, and steeply descending steps. I shall always see those steps in my dreams, for I came to learn what they meant. At the time, I hardly knew whether to call them steps or merely footholds in a precipitous descent. The words and warnings of Arab prophets seemed to float across the desert from the lands that men known to the nameless city that men dare not know. Yet I hesitated only for a moment before advancing through the portal and commencing to climb cautiously down the steep passage, feet first, as though on a ladder. Tis only in the terrible phantasm of drugs or delirium that any other man can have had such a descent as mine. The narrow passage led infinitely down like some hideous haunted well, and the torch I held above my head could not light the unknown depths toward which I was crawling. I lost track of the hours and forgot to consult my watch, though I was frightened when I thought of the distance I must be traversing. There were changes of direction in the steepness, and once I came to a long, low, level passage where I had to wiggle feet first along the rocky floor, holding my torch at the arm's length beyond my head. The place was not high enough for kneeling. After that were more of the steep steps, and I was still scrambling down interminably when my failing torch died out. I do not think I noticed it at the time, for when I did notice it, I was still holding it high above me as if it were ablaze. It was quite unbalanced with the instinct for the strange and unknown which had made me wander upon earth and haunt her afar, ancient and forbidden places. In the darkness there flashed before my mind fragments of cherished treasury of daemonic lore, sentenced from al Hazred, the mad Arab, paragraphs from the apocryphal nightmares of Damascus, an infamous line from the delirious image de monde of Gautier de Metz. I repeated queer extracts and muttered Afrasia the daemon that floated with him down the Oxus, later chanting over and over again a phrase from one of Lord Dunsany's tales, the unverberating blackness of the abyss. Once when the descent grew amazingly steep, I recited something in singing song from Thomas More until I feared to recite more. A reservoir of darkness, black as witches' cauldrons are when filled, with moon drugs in the eclipse distilled, leaning to look if foot might pass down through the chasm, I saw beneath, as far as vision could explore, the jetty sides as smooth as glass, looking as if just varnished with the dark pitch the sea of death throws out upon its slimy shore. Time had quite ceased to exist when my feet again felt a level floor, and I found myself in a place slightly higher than the rooms in the two smaller temples, now so incalculable far above my head. I could not quite stand, but could kneel upright, and in the dark I shuffled and crept hither and thither at random. I soon knew that I was in a narrow passage whose walls were lined with cases of wood having glass fronts. As in the Paleozoic and abysmal place, I felt of such things as polished wood and glass, I shuddered at the possible implications. The cases were apparently ranged along each side of the passage at regular intervals, and were oblong and horizontal, hideously like coffins in shape and size. When I tried to move two or three for further examination, I found they were firmly fastened. I saw that the passage was a long one so I floundered ahead, rapidly and creeping run that would have seemed horrible had an any eye watched me in the blackness. Crossing from side to side, occasionally to feel around my surroundings, and be sure that the walls and rows of cases still stretched on. Man is so used to thinking visually that I almost forgot the darkness and pitched the endless corridor of wood and glass in its low-studded monotony as though I saw it. And then, in a moment of indescribable emotion, I did see it. Just when my fancy merged into real sight, I could not tell, but there came a gradual glow ahead, and all at once I knew that I saw dim outlines of the corridor and the cases, revealed by some unknown subterranean phosphorescence. For a little while, all was exactly as I had imagined, since the glow was very faint, but I mechanically kept on stumbling ahead into the stronger light, I realized that my fancy had been but feeble. This hall was no relic of credity like the temples in the city above but a monument of the most magnificent and exotic art, rich, vivid, 
and daringly fantastic designs and pictures formed continuous scheme of mural paintings whose line and colors were beyond description. The cases were of strange golden wood, with fronts of exquisite glass, and contained the mummified forms of creatures outreaching in grotesqueness and the most chaotic dreams of man. To convey any idea of these monstrosities is impossible. They were of the reptile kind, with the body lines suggesting sometimes the crocodile, sometimes the seal, but were more often nothing of which either the naturalist or the paleontologist ever heard. In size they approximated a small man, and their four legs bore delicate and eventually flexible feet, curiously like human hands and fingers. But strangest of all were their heads, which presented a contour violating all known biologic principles. To nothing can be such as well compared. In one flash I thought of comparisons as varied as the cat, the bulldog, the mystic satyr, and the human being. Not Jove himself had so colossal and protuberant a forehead, yet the horns and the noselessness and the alligator-like jaw placed the thing outside all established categories. I debated for a time on the reality of the mummies, half suspecting they were artificial dolls, but soon decided they were indeed some paleogene species which had lived when the nameless city was alive. To crown the grotesqueness, most of them were gorgeously enrobed in the costliest of fabrics, and lavished laden with ornaments of gold jewels and unknown shining metals. The importance of these crawling creatures must have been vast, for they held first place among the wild designs of the frescoed walls and ceiling, with the matchless skills had the artists drawn them in the world of their own, wherein they had cities and gardens fashioned to suit their dimensions, and I could not help but think that their pictured history was allegorical, perhaps shewing in progress of the race and worshipped them. These creatures, I said to myself, were to the men of the nameless city what the she-wolf was to Rome, or some totem beast in the tribe of the Indians. Holding this view, I thought I could trace roughly a wonderful epic of the nameless city, the tale of the mighty sea-cross metropolis that ruled the world before Africa rose out of the waves, and of its struggling as the sea shrank away and the desert crept at the fertile valley that held it, I saw its wars and triumphs its troubles and defeats, and afterward its terrible fight against the desert when the thousands of its people here represented an allegory of the grotesque reptiles were driven to chisel their way down through the rocks in the marvelous manner to other world whereof their prophets had told them. It was all vividly weird and realistic, and its connection with the awesome descent I had made was unmistakable. I even recognized the passages. As I crept along the corridor, Toward the brighter light, I saw later stages of the paint epic. The leave-taking of the race that had dwelt in the nameless city, and was the valley wrong for ten million years. The race whose soul shrank from quitting scenes their bodies had known so long, where they had settled as nomads in earth's youth, hewing in the virgin rocks those primal shrines of which they never ceased to worship. Now the light was better, I studied the pictures more closely, and remembering that the strange reptiles must represent the unknown men, pondering upon the customs of the nameless city. Many things were particular and inexplicable. The civilization, which included a written alphabet, had seemingly risen to a higher order than those immeasurable later civilizations of Egypt and Chaldea. Yet there were curious omissions. I could, for example, find no pictures to represent deaths or funeral customs, save such as were related to war, violence, and plagues, and I wondered the residents shewn concerning natural death. It was as the ideal of earthly immortality had been fostered as a cheering illusion. Still nearing the end of the passage were painted scenes of the utmost picturesqueness and extravagance, contrasting views of the nameless city and the desolation and growing ruin, and the strange new realm or paradise to which the race had hewn its way through the stone. In these views the city and the desert valley were shewn always by moonlight, a golden nimbus hovering over the fallen walls and half revealing the splendid perfection of former times, shewn spectacularly and elusively by the artist. The paradisal scenes were almost too extravagant to be believed, portraying a hidden world of eternal day filled the glorious cities and eternal hills and valleys. At the very last I thought I saw the origins of the artist anticlimax. The paintings were less skillful and much more bizarre than even the wildest and earliest scenes. They seemed to record a slow decadence of the ancient stock, coupled with the growing ferocity toward the outside world from which it was driven by the desert. 
The forms of the people, always represented by the sacred reptiles, appeared to be gradually wasting away through their spirits as shun hovering about the ruins by moonlight gained in proportion. Immaculated priests, displaying as reptiles in ornate robes, cursed the upper air and all those who breathed it. In one terrible final scene, shun a primitive-looking man, perhaps a pioneer or an ancient realm, the city of pillars, torn to pieces by members of the elderly race. I remembered the Arabs feared the nameless city, and was glad that beyond this place the gray walls and ceilings were bare. As I viewed the pageant of mural history, I approached very closely at the end of the low ceiling hall, and was aware of the great gate through which the climb of the illuminating phosphorescence. Creeping up to it, I cried aloud a transcendent amazement at what lay beyond, for instead of another and brighter chamber, there was a lunar void of uniform radiance, such as one might be fancy when gazing down from the peak of Mount Everest upon the sea of sunlit mist. Behind me was a passage so cramped that I could not stand upright in it, but before me was an infinity of subterranean fulsions. Reaching down from the passage into the abyss was a head of steep flight of steps, small numerous steps like those of the black passage I had traversed, but after a few feet the glowing vapor concealed everything. Swung back open against the left wall of the passage was a massive door of brass, incredibly thick and decorated with fantastic bas-relief, which could, if closed, shut the whole inner world of light away from the vault and passage of rocks. I looked at the steps, and for a nonce dared not try them. I touched the open brass door and could not move it. Then I sank prone to the stone floor, my mind aflame with prodigious reflection which not even a death-like exhaustion could banish. As I lay still with closed eyes, free to ponder, many things I had lightly noted in the frescoes came back to me and new and terrible significance. Scenes representing the nameless sea in its heyday, the vegetation of the valley all around it, and the distant lands which merchants traded. The allegory of crawling creatures puzzled me by this universal prominence, and I wonder that it should be closely followed in pictured history of such importance. In the frescoes the nameless city had been shewn in proportion fitted to the reptiles, I wonder what its real proportions and magnificence had been, and reflected on a moment of certain oddities I had noticed in the ruins. I thought curiously of the lowness of the primal temples and the underground corridors, which were doubtless hewn thus out the defiance of the reptile deities they were honored, though perforce reduced the worship to crawling. Perhaps the very rite had involved a crawling in imitation of the creatures. No religious theory, however, could it easily explain why the level passage in that awesome descent should be as low as the temple, or lower, since one not even could kneel in it. As I thought of the crawling creatures whose hideous mummified forms were so close to me, I felt a new throb of fear. Mental associations are curious, and I shrank from the idea expected for the poor primitive man torn to pieces in the last painting. Mine was the only human form amidst the many relics the symbol of primordial life. But, as always, in my strange and roving existence, wonder soon drove out my fear. For the luminous abyss what it might contain presented a problem worthy of the greatest explorer, that a weird world of mystery lay far down that the flight of particular steps I could not doubt, and I hoped to find there those human memorials which painted corridors had failed to give. The frescoes had pictured unbelievable cities, hills and valleys in its lower realm, and my fancy dwelt on the rich and the Colosseum ruin that awaited me. My fears, indeed, considered the past rather than the future. Not even the physical horror of my position in the cramped corridor of dead reptiles and antediluvian frescoes, miles below the world I knew and faced by another world of eerie light and mist, could match the lethal dread I felt of the abysmal antiquity of the scene in its soul. An antiqueness so vast that the measurement is feeble seemed to leer down from the primal stones and rocks hewn temple in the nameless city, while the very last of the astounding maps in the frescoes shewn ocean and its contents that man had forgotten with only here and there some vaguely familiar outlines of what could have happened in the geological eon since the painting ceased and the death-hating rays resentfully scumbled to the decay no man might say. Life had once teemed in these caverns and luminous realms below. Now I was alone with these vivid relics, and I trembled to think of the countless ages through which these relics had kept a silent and deserted vigil. Suddenly there came another burst of acute fear which had intentionally seized me ever since I had first saw the terrible valley in Nameless City under a cold moon, and despite my exhaustion, 
I found myself starting frantically to a sitting position and gazing back along the black corridor towards the tunnel that rose to the outer world. My sensations were much like those which had made me shun the nameless city at night, and were as inexplicable as they were potent. In another moment, however, I received a greater shock in the form of a deafening sound. The first which had broken the utter silence of the tomb-like depth, it was a deep, low moaning, as of a distant throng of commending spirits and name from the direction in which I was staring. Its volume rapidly grew, till it soon reverberated frightfully, through the low passage, and at the same time I became conscious of the increasing daunt of cold air, likewise flowing from the tunnel and the city above. The touch of the air seemed to restore my balance, for I instantly recalled the sudden gusts which had arisen around the mouth of the abyss each sunset and sunrise, one of which had indeed severed to reveal the hidden tunnel to me. I looked at my watch and saw the sunrise was near, so braced myself to resist the gale which was sweeping down to the cavern home as it swept forth into evening. My fear again waned low, since a natural phenomenon tends to dispel brooding over the unknown. More and more madly poured the shrieking, moaning night, wind into the gulf of the inner earth. I dropped prone again and clutched vainly at the floor for fear of being swept broadly through the open gate into the phosphorescent abyss. Such fury I had not expected, and I grew aware of the actual slipping of my form towards the abyss. I was beset by a thousand new terrors of apprehension and imagination. The malignancy of the blast awakened incredible fancies. Once more I compared myself shudderingly to the only human image in that frightful corridor, the man who was torn to pieces by the nameless race. For a fiend was crawling of the swirling currents, they seemed to abide vindictive rage of all stronger because it was largely impotent. I think I screamed frantically near the last. I was almost mad, but if I did, so my cries were lost to the hell-bound babble of the hallowing wind wraiths. I tried to crawl against the murderer's invisible torrent, but could not even hold my own as I was pushed slowly and inexorably towards the unknown world. Finally, reason must have wholly snapped. I fell to the babbling over and over the unexplained couplet of the mad Arab Alhazred who dreamed of the nameless city. It is not dead which can eternal lie. In strange eons, even death may die. Only the grim, brooding desert gods knew what really took place, what indescribable struggles and scrambles in the dark I endured, what abandoned guide me back to life, where I must always remember and shiver in the night wind till oblivion, or worse, claims me. Monstrous, unnatural colossus was the thing, too far beyond all the ideals of man and believed except in the silent, damnable small hours when one cannot sleep. I have said that the fury of the rushing blast was inferno, cacodemonical, and his voices were hideous with the pent-up viciousness of desolate entities presenting those voices. While still chaotic before me, seemed my beating brain to articulate from behind me, and down there in the grave for unburdened aeon dead antiques, leagues below the dawn-lit world of men. I tried. I heard the ghastly cursing and snarling of strange-tongued fiends. Turning, I saw the outlined against the luminous aether of the abyss, what could not be seen against the dusk of the corridor. A nightmare horde of rushing devils, hate distorted, grotesquely panoplied, half transparent devils of a race no man might mistake, the crawling reptiles of the nameless city. And as the winds died away, I was plunged into the ghoul people blackness of earth's bowels. But behind the last of the creatures, the great brazen door clanged shut with a deafening peal of the metallic music whose reverberation swelled at the distant world to hail the rising sun as Mon hails it from the banks of the Nile. End of The Nameless City